What does it mean to care for sheep? Different shepherds might have different answers to this question. For the good shepherd, however, caring for the sheep is deeply relational and costly. The good shepherd knows his sheep intimately. And as we will see in this session, he is even willing to lay down his life for them. Thus far in the Gospels, we have looked at Jesus as he affirms himself to be the Good Shepherd of the 23rd Psalm. Then in Mark 6, we saw him enacting the responsibilities of the Good Shepherd. We're now ready to look at the 10th chapter of John and focus on some of the same major themes which we have already examined in four of the prophetic writings and also now in two of the Gospels. In this case, we need to talk for just a minute about the nature of sheep herding in the Middle East. There are people, like in the story which Jesus told, who have 100 sheep. And they simply, this is quite wealthy, if you have that many, you're a relatively wealthy man. But smaller herds also come together and that is that in a traditional village, every family's got to have two or three sheep because that's your winter clothing. They have to have a donkey because that's your transportation system. And uh, they must have also a cow because that's the protein for the family. So every family's got these few animals. The sheep, just enough for making the winter clothing, as we mentioned. Uh, you generally spin your own thread. You take it then to the weaver who makes it into some kind of a cloak for wintertime to keep yourself warm through the winter. So you can't afford the time involved in having someone from the family herd three or four sheep and even an extended family. Let's say you've got a number of households, maybe 15 sheep if there are five different households. That still, you really can't quite afford to do that. So I have seen uh, herds that small, but that would be rare. Generally what you do is you combine with the people living on your alley. Now, in the ancient Middle East, like in the middle of the city of Jerusalem and in the middle of the city of Bethlehem to our day, the streets are just wide enough for a loaded camel. Uh, you can't drive down them, or barely, Usually they're stepped. And so everybody's house opens right onto the street. There may be a bench out there for sitting and chatting with passers-by. And you do a lot of selling and of vegetables and things of that kind in the street. But as regards the shepherd, the people living in one alley, and the alley usually is closed at one end and then opens out to the open countryside at the other end, Every family's got three or four sheep. They combine and either one young man or two young women will herd the sheep for the season. There might be 50, 60, whatever sheep. And what happens every day is the shepherd comes to the end of the alley, gives the call. At the giving of the call, everybody who is waiting for it opens the door of the little courtyard that may be at the side of the house or maybe the back. And the sheep go out into the street and they follow the call and off they go. Nobody's got any hay stored in the house. Not like American farmers who cut the hay and store it and they can feed their sheep all winter long. No, the sheep have to go out every day because 
they graze. That's the only food there is. And if they can't get there, then the sheep are going to lose weight and finally die. So what happens? How do you manage this when you've got rain in November and December, and if you're lucky, a little bit in January, and by the end of February, the rains are over and there isn't going to be any more, and now you've got all these nine months of the rest of the calendar year, and the shepherds going out from a city like Bethlehem, I've watched them do this. Actually, two weeks ago I was there, and I again was delighted to see this happening. They will go out until they can find something to eat. Now, this is open land that, doesn't, that nobody can farm because there's not enough water. And then at night, they'll come back to the village. Every sheep goes to its own home. And then the next day, they go out. And of course, this time, they've got to go a little bit further. And all the other herds in the town are doing the same thing. By the time you get to the middle of summer, it's a long ways out there before you find something for them to eat that either your herd or some other herd has not already eaten. So the time and energy getting there and the time and energy getting back is too much. What do you do? They find caves, and across the cave, the shepherds will, they will build a slow wall with just enough space for one sheep to enter at a time. And that's how the shepherd can count the sheep at the end of the day. He'll put his stick across that open space, and the sheep will come in, and they can't jump on top of each other, and they can't crowd in two at a time. And he'll be able to count them and get an accurate count. And that's why the, the thing of going after the lost sheep is tricky, because it's already late in the afternoon, and you've got to hustle, and you don't have much light at, at the night except for just a, perhaps a small lamp. All right, so that's what you do out, and, or if there isn't a cave nearby, the shepherds will build an enclosure. I've seen them on the, in the hill country of Judea, and they're big enough to hold about 100 sheep or a little more. Uh, the walls are about this high, uh, just high enough that a sheep can't jump over it, or in the past, the hyena and the wolf, occasionally the bear and the lion, but the lions were gone by the time of the Crusaders a thousand years ago, and the hyenas and the wolves uh, didn't make it when the shepherds got guns, and they're, so far as I know, are all gone now. So a hundred years ago, there were still shepherds, particularly the hyenas were a problem. So what do you do is you build this thing, and it, then you work thorns into the top, big, big, really ugly looking thorns, so that the hyena or the wolf can't jump over, and your sheep can't jump to get out. No doors, no windows, no roof, no nothing. Just open space. Never rains, so you don't have to worry about that in the summer when they use these. So guess who sleeps across the entrance? The shepherd, of course. In the open country, the shepherd becomes the door. Morning in the village, the shepherd is not the door. There are commentators who have said, well, the imagery here is manufactured, it's fabricated. The people who wrote this stuff really don't know what they're doing. In one place, Jesus is the door. In one place, he isn't. And so we don't have very high quality material here. No, that's not the case. The first scene, which is John 10, 1 to 5, and re is mourning in the village. What do we have? The shepherd comes, he does not enter the sheepfold, the one who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way over the wall of the uh, courtyard in the village home, is a thief or a robber. But the one who enters by the door is the shepherd of, of the sheep, to him the gatekeeper opens, namely the gatekeeper, probably the owner of the house and the sheep. We're told then the sheep hear his voice. We mentioned in our first study, it may be the call and it may be the voice, just tau, 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 come here, come here, come here. They recognize his voice. It says he calls his own sheep by name. Many commentators have wrestled with this. Even people who know the Middle East quite well have wrestled with this. My conclusion to the matter from reading people who were shepherds and then wrote up accounts of their being shepherds, 
the shepherd, even when he has a relatively large flock, there are a group of sheep that really kind of become pets to the shepherd. And he does name them. And the, usually the name has something to do with the way they look. This one is called Big Red, and that one's called Floppy Ears, and this one is called Long Tail, and this one is called, is called whatever. Uh, lo, you know, uh, names that identify the, the shepherd, Big Joe or whatever. All of the sheep uh, don't think so. I, I've never found a case of that. I've never found a shepherd who claimed that he read an account of any shepherd or anybody who visited the Middle East any time in the last 200 years and accounted where a shepherd with a large number of sheep ever tried to name them all. But he does name some. He calls his own sheep by name, leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them. We talked about this. Before he gets to the country, the place where there's something to eat, he will walk briskly to keep them from stopping and trying to nibble. As soon as they get to the place where they can eat, then he slows down at the pace at which they're able to consume the stuff there that is good for the sheep to eat. If there is a tree with low branches, then the shepherd will break branches off of the tree and throw it down for the sheep. I saw this outside Bethlehem just last week. I read about it, but I'd never seen it. The sheep were eating the stuff on the ground. It was a series of terraces. But when he came to a tree that was not a fruit tree, kind of a, I don't know, I could, it was too far away. I couldn't exactly see what it was, but it had large leaves and he just broke off some of the branches and kind of like passing out chocolate goodies to them. He, he threw them in front of the sheep in various places and they chomped away. They will not follow the stranger. They will flee for him. They do not know the voice of the stranger. And then we're told that in this figure that Jesus used, they didn't understand what he was saying. And so he tried again. Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Now we're overnight in the open countryside. Those who came before me are thieves and robbers. There was a lot of people who claimed to be the Messiah of God in the intertestament literature. There was a lot of leadership that failed the community, uh, the violence involved, the wars that were fought. It's a horrendous period, the roughly 200 years before the time of Jesus. They're thieves and robbers. The sheep, the true believers, those who are seeking a Messiah that was in harmony with what they knew of the Messiah, particularly from the great servant songs of Isaiah, they heed his voice. In the very middle, I am the door. Anyone enters by me will be saved will go in and out and find pasture. You don't always find pasture. This is a good day. This is a good shepherd. He knows that they go in and out. And mind you, the food they need is not in the enclosure. It's out there in the big, broader world. I'm sure most of you, perhaps all of you watching this film, have engaged in ministry beyond the doors of your church. And you have discovered that in that you are giving of yourself, but also you are fed. Your own soul is refreshed and is fed by being out beyond the bounds of the doors of the church. And this is a part of what is here also being, this, being said. The thief comes only to kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. All through the Johannine Gospel, the word to be saved and the word to have life are interchangeable. And so here we have to be saved and to have life and to have it abundantly are all woven together. Then the story goes on to the critical part of the account. And that's the part at which we wish to focus now as we look at what now comes before us, namely the big fight with the wolf. And now Jesus slash John. Is the, are these the words of John? In some sense, yes. Are they the words of Jesus? Definitely so. Can we sort out what are the words of Jesus and what are the words of John? No, we can't. 
They are woven together in a great, brilliant, inspired way, and we are to be enriched of it, knowing that it is, in fact, the words of Jesus, and it is also the reflection of John, and the text is enriched in the process. It is not in any way diminished by these two great figures participating in the words that we now have on the page. The first section is the fight with the wolf. I am the good shepherd. We've already talked about this. The good shepherd means David and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Zechariah. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The first one is an affirmation of identity. I am the good shepherd. The second one is an affirmation of lifestyle. I lay down my life for the sheep. Every human being out there has got to answer those two primary questions. Who am I and what am I going to do? The first is your identity and the second is your lifestyle. Summarized in these two brilliant lines, we have them together affirmed in this great verse. A few verses later, it's repeated after the fight with the wolf. We'll come to the fight with the wolf after we talk about the way this is repeated. And almost the same language is used. The two lines. Now it reads, I am the good shepherd and I lay down my life for the sheep. It's personal now. He lays down his life, not just the good shepherd lays down his life. So what Jesus has done is at the top, he's taken a Hebrew parallelism I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And Jesus has split that in half, brought it down later in this affirmation of the life of the good shepherd, and has split it in half and has added new material to the middle. It's kind of like the composition of a sandwich. You start off with the bun, you slice it in half, you open it up, and now you put the hamburger and the pickle in the middle. So Jesus is the bun, and the bun is, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, or in this case now, I lay down my life for the sheep, and what are the pickle and the hamburger a patty that goes in the middle? Two, affirmations. I know my own, my own know me. As the Father knows me, and I know the Father. Now think of three links of a chain. Jesus starts off, I know my own and my own know me. The shepherd knows the sheep. And the word know here in Hebraic thought is not intellectual information only, it's experiential in nature. This is the word that is used for the marital relationship all through scripture. The man knows his wife. And so there is an intimate relationship between the shepherd and the sheep. And then the second line says, as I know the Father and the Father knows me. The shepherd is in the middle and the shepherd has an intimate relationship with the sheep and the shepherd has an intimate relationship, the shepherd, namely the son, has an intimate relationship with the Father. The intimate relationship between the Father and the Son in the Trinity is a potential model for the intimacy of the relationship between Christ and the believing community. The word as. As the Father knows me and I know the Father. Because of the cross. Jesus describes the cross in the outer bun, and then he puts these, this three-chain link in the center. Now, in what sense does the intimate relationship between the Son and the Father, in what sense is that a model for a, the intimate relationship between the Son and the believing community because of the cross? Now, when you get this all figured out, you write to me. 
We're talking here about profound theology put in very simple words and in the dramatic story of the Good Shepherd. And the language stretches to meaning almost beyond what rationally we can put into words. All right, we can understand a part of it. If one person offers a costly demonstration of unexpected love to another person, when that person accepts that love, there is a unique bond which happens between the two of them. If that person rejects the love that is offered, then there is inevitably a distancing between them. The father in the story of the prodigal son at great cost and in great self-humiliation before the village because gentlemen with long robes and with land and with flocks and herds and servants, they don't run down the road in Middle Eastern traditional life. This man is humiliating himself in order to protect his son from the hostility of the village. Costly love is being offered to him. The son can refuse. If he does, there is an inevitable distance that will be there even more than it was at the beginning. When he accepts, there is going to be a fusion that takes place between the two of them. That much I can get my mind around. But I think there is more. I rejoice as I reflect on this, and I commend it to your own reflection uh, to discover what is going on in this profound statement. In the middle, we find that there is a hireling, and the hireling doesn't own the sheep and couldn't care less. And when the wolf shows up, the hireling takes off. And then we find that there is a good shepherd because he cares for the sheep. He sticks around and he fights with the wolf. And the shepherd dies, but wins. The wolf is either driven off or it is killed. We're not told. But please notice that we don't have any description of the scene, the big scene of the fight between the shepherd and the wolf. The New Testament never engages in the pornography of suffering. It never gives you the gory details. When it comes to the crucifixion itself, it says they crucified him. In Aramaic, that's one word. In Hebrew, that's two words. How tall is the cross? We don't know. What shape is it? We don't know. How many nails? We don't know. How high off the ground was he? We don't know. What kind of wood was it? We don't know. None of that. Was he crucified like this or like this? Is he seated on a small seat or isn't he? None of that detail is there. And none of the continued agony of the three hours are described. The New Testament authors want you to think about what it means and not to focus on the brutalities of the scene itself. The same thing happens here. The wolf shows up, there's a battle, which we're not told about, and we're told that the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, assumption being that he won and the, and the wolf is killed. I can't prove it, but I have a deep sense that probably the hireling in the back of Jesus' mind is the high priestly leadership. And the wolf, I think, he's talking about Rome, the forces that joined to kill this good man, is at the, I think, is at the heart of this parable, even though it's impossible for us to know until we ask our Lord uh, in the next life. What happens next? Next we get a discussion of other sheep that are not of this fold, and that's the task of the vision of evangelism. I must bring them and they will heed my voice. There's the active, he must bring them, he's going to do it. And there is the passive, they must respond and heed his voice. There's the action of witness evangelism. And the third, there will be one flock and one shepherd. And that's the result of, of mission and evangelism. Why is this discussion put in this place? The verses that follow we will find that they are about the cross and the resurrection. So Jesus starts off by discussing the cross, the big fight with the wolf, and he ends up by discussing the cross and the resurrection. Think of them as a launching pad. 
and the launching pad launches the mission out into the world of witness and evangelism. And without that cross and resurrection, there's going to be no rocket launched off of that pad. And look, remember the construction of Paul's letter to the first Corinthians. In the first chapter, he talks about the cross. In the 15th chapter, he talks about the cross and the resurrection. And in the very middle, he talks about witness to the non-Christian. How do we live out our lives in the midst of a pagan world and commend to them our message? Exactly the same structure of material in 1 Corinthians we find here in this great hymn to Christ, the, uh, Christ crucified. We then turn to the final section, and this is, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, I have power to take it again. This commandment slash charge I have received from the Father. Yes, the cross grows out of the anger of God. God is angry over sin, but it also grows out of the love of God because it is in God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The solution to the problem of sin grows out not only of God's anger, but profoundly out of God's love. And that is affirmed here. It is also affirmed that Jesus is in charge. I lay down my life that I may take it again. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. These verses are absolutely critical in our contemporary world as we as Christians on the one side are engaged in dialogue and witness with our Jewish friends, and we are able to say to them, Jesus himself affirmed that no one took his life. He laid it down of his own accord. There is no place in the book of John or in the New Testament for anti-Semitism. Jesus directs the cross. He's the one who tells Pilate, you can't do anything unless it is given to you from above. In the 13th chapter of John, it says, At knowing that all things had been given into his hands and that he has all power, then he, he washed the disciples' feet. We, he launches the story into the story of the cross. The other side is the inevitable dialogue witness with Islam. Islam believes the wrong thing for the right reason. They believe the cross never took place because they are deeply convinced that, that God would never have allowed this. The, the great prophets always win. God is always with them, and the fact that God is always with them is proof of the fact that they are the great prophets. So now we Muslims uh, respect Jesus as a great prophet, and how can you Christians tell us a story about how his enemies overpowered him, beat up on him, took him, killed him? That's impossible. We can't accept that. Our reply is, that isn't the way it happened. His enemies did not overpower him. He surrendered himself to the worst that humankind can do. And in the resurrection, there is victory over sin and death. And the greatest victory ever given to any of the prophets, any of the prophets, Christian and otherwise, is the victory over sin and death. Never see this as Jesus failed, Jesus is weak, Jesus got beaten up on. No, it is an affirmation of the great the tremendous reality of what was given to Jesus in the resurrection in his victory over sin and over death. And thereby, in this language about the cross and about the resurrection, we have theology that is deep and profound and touches on the deepest level of who we are. We've mentioned regarding the Jews and regarding Islam, We've mentioned the fact that the cross is an expression of the love of God. 
There is also here a theology of mission. I lay down my life, yes. We are to go to the world as servants of the world, but we choose the path of our servanthood. I will wash your floors, but if I decide that the little lady across the street needs me to wash her floors more than yours, I'm going to walk out of your house across the street and wash her floors, and you do not have the power to control the direction of my servanthood. It is servanthood but it's servanthood, the direction of which I am able to control. Yes, salvation flows from the cross and from the resurrection. It's not just the price paid, it's also the victory won. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ has not raised, you are still in your sins. There are a lot of Christians out there so focused on the price paid, they think, yes, died, he said it's finished, and if God, in the mercy of God had taken Jesus up into heaven without any resurrection, we're okay because the price is paid and it's all over. And the New Testament says no. It is not just a price paid. It is a victory won. And without the victory won, the price paid is in vain. And this comes where Jesus affirms, I lay down my life and I take it again. He puts the two of them together. And finally, in John and Paul, Paul talks about God raised him up, and Jesus says, I have power to take it again. These are mysteries beyond our own ability to understand them. Let us talk about a great diamond which sheds light in a variety of directions. Don't worry about the fact that these are logically inconsistent. We're talking about mysteries and wonders that are beyond any human rational understanding of them. And finally, in the theology of the cross, evil is engaged, suffering is endured, costly love is demonstrated, and victory is won. I lay down my life that I may take it again. Why? To demonstrate that sin and death are defeated. The shepherd dies, but in the process, sin and death are defeated on the cross and through the resurrection. Hallelujah.